Hey, what's up, Ken Peeps? Who is ready for some free response practice? Let's get subatomic. A student compares some models of the atom. These models are listed in the table below in order of development from top to bottom. Boom. Part A. State the model that first included electrons as subatomic particles. All right, as I scan my data table, I notice that in the Thompson model, the conclusion from his experiment indicated that atoms have small, negatively charged particles, also known as electrons. The Thompson model first included electrons as subatomic particles. Boom. One point. Part B. State one conclusion about the internal structure of the atom that resulted from the gold foil experiment. Well, as I come back up to my data table, let's take a look at the Rutherford model. Recall that Rutherford's model of the atom came as a result of the gold foil experiment. As I take a look at the conclusion, notice that the gold foil experiment helped us understand that an atom is mostly empty space and there's a small, dense, positively charged region known as the nucleus. One conclusion that resulted from the gold foil experiment was that an atom has a small, positively charged nucleus. Boom. write one conclusion. Maybe you want to talk about how the gold foil experiment resulted in our understanding of the atom being mostly empty space. Totally cool. You would still get the point. Just make sure you include one conclusion from the gold foil experiment. Boom. Part C. Using the conclusion from the Rutherford model, identify the charged subatomic particle that is located in the nucleus. All right, as we once again take a look at the conclusion from the Rutherford model of the atom, Keep in mind that the result of this experiment was identifying the nucleus as a small, dense, positively charged region. should know that that nucleus is made up of neutrons and protons. But which of those subatomic particles is the positively charged one? That's what we're looking for to answer this question. The charged subatomic particle located in the nucleus is the proton. Boom. The neutron has no charge. Part D. State one way in which the Bohr model agrees with the Thompson model. <laughs> one more time, let's take a look at these two models and think about what they have in agreement with one another. As I look at their conclusion, recall that the Thompson model is where we identified that atoms have small, negatively charged particles, which we now call electrons. The Bohr model also believes that atoms have electrons. Now, the Thomson model thought that those electrons were embedded in a solid sphere, while the Bohr model indicates those electrons are hanging out in the empty space around the nucleus. Both models indicated that atoms have electrons. Both models agree that atoms contain small, negatively charged particles, also known as electrons. Boom. The student continued to investigate Dalton and his original postulates of atomic theory. One of the concepts that she explored was isotopes. Answer the questions related to isotopes and atomic theory that follow. Some isotopes of potassium are potassium-37, potassium-39, potassium-40, potassium-41, and potassium-42. The natural abundance and the atomic mass for the naturally occurring isotopes of potassium are shown in the table below. Boom. Part E. List one of the postulates from Dalton's atomic theory that is no longer true due to the discovery of isotopes. Explain in terms of subatomic particles for the different isotopes of naturally occurring potassium. First, let's list out this postulate that's no longer true. All atoms of the same element are identical. Nice try, Dalton, but that's no longer correct. Now let's talk about why in terms of 
isotopes in the subatomic particles that we see in the different naturally occurring isotopes of potassium. This postulate is no longer true because isotopes are atoms of the same element with different masses. Ho -ho. Now let's make sure to explain in terms of subatomic particles for the different isotopes. Although all isotopes of potassium have 19 protons, <laughs> potassium 39 has 20 neutrons, potassium 40 has 21 neutrons, and potassium 41 has 22 neutrons. Boom. Listed out the postulate that's no longer true, and then explained in terms of subatomic particles for the different isotopes. Make sure you're reading carefully and answering the question as you're asked. Part F. Show a numerical setup and calculate the atomic mass of potassium. Recall the formula for average atomic mass. Boom. We're taking the mass of the individual isotopes, multiplying it by their percent abundances, and adding them all together. In this case, because we have three naturally occurring isotopes, we have to do that three times. Take a quick look at our data table. First isotope mass, 38.9 percent abundance, 93.26 percent. Boom. Don't forget to move your decimal two places. Second isotope mass, 39.96 percent abundance, 0.01 percent. Boom. Third isotope mass, 40.96 natural abundance, 6.73 percent. Don't forget as you set up and work with your percentages to move your decimal two place values each time. Now, just hop to your good friend calculator. Parentheses, 38.96 times 0.9326. Close parentheses, answer. Plus parentheses, 39.96 times 0 0.0001. Close parentheses, answer. Plus parentheses, 40.96 times 0 0.0673. Close parentheses, answer. Average atomic mass of potassium, 39.09 AMU. Boom. Two points. Shown a numerical setup, calculating. That brings us finally to part G. Show a numerical setup using dimensional analysis. Dimensional analysis. And calculate the number of potassium atoms in a 176 gram sample of naturally occurring potassium. Remember, always start your conversion with the amount that you provided. First thing I'm gonna do, convert this to number of moles. Recall that the relationship between one mole of an element and its mass in grams comes from the periodic table. However, keep in mind that we just solved for the average atomic mass which is numerically equal to the molar mass in part F. So I'm just gonna sub that in. If I stopped right here, my units of grams would cancel out and I'd be left with moles. Before I continue, I always like to think to myself, do I have more than, less than, or exactly one mole? Well, if one mole is 39 or roughly 40 grams, and I have 176 grams, I have way more than one mole of potassium. Which means, as I finish this up and convert to atoms of potassium, and I think about the relationship between moles and atoms, which is given by Avogadro's number, because I know that I have more than one mole of potassium, I'm gonna have more than Avogadro's number of atoms. Let's calculate this up. 176 times one, answer. Divide by 39.09, answer. Times 26.02, second E, 23. Close parentheses, answer. To three sig figs, 2.71 times 10 to the 24 atoms of potassium. Boom. Again, always stop and check to see if your answer makes sense. I expect a number that's larger than Avogadro's number because the mass that I originally started with is greater than the mass in grams of one mole of potassium. All right, that does it for this vid. Have a fantastic day.